Welcome to another live author talk for the National World War II Museum's official book club, Read to Win the War. Uh, I'm Wesley Lucas, a librarian at the National World War II Museum in New Orleans. Uh, for June, the book club has been reading two books, actually, uh, to commemorate the Battle of Dunkirk, which ended uh, 80 years ago this month. Uh, for the basic background, we read the classic history, The Miracle of Dunkirk by Walter Lord. And for more context and detail from recent research, we read Dunkirk, The History Behind the Major Motion Picture by Joshua Levine, who has kindly joined us today to, to discuss this pivotal event in history. Um, just a quick intro, Joshua Levine is a bit of a Renaissance man. He's uh, had previous careers as a lawyer and actor, and now he is a historian and author. Uh, he's written several best-selling histories like The Secret History of the Blitz, Operation Fortitude, as well as several titles in the Forgotten Voices series of uh, oral history collections, including one on Dunkirk. Uh, welcome, Josh, and thanks so much for joining us. Thank you very much for having me, Wes. It's lovely, really, really nice to be here. It's nice to be almost in New Orleans, um, and I'm ready to discuss whatever you like. <clears throat> Sounds great. Um, we'll certainly spend most of the time on your book, but since we did talk about two books, I'll start off with a question about Walter Lord's Miracle of Dunkirk. Uh, he described it basically as a series of crises that were met with a series of fortunate events and uh, sprinkled in with some British ingenuity. Uh, does that fit your view of the event? I think it does. Uh, I, well, what, what I particularly like about Walter Lord, I, li I like, you know, it, it, it's very, very well written. It's very easy to read. It's very, you know, it, 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 it takes really, you know, a huge, you know, it was a complicated event um, and there was so much happening, so many different kinds of things happening. Uh, and, and, and he makes it very, very understandable. And I think that is a quite a good description. There was, I mean, you know, what, what you've got to sort of remember about the, the, the evacuation, first of all the defeat well the first thing to remember is it was a defeat uh it, you know the, the battle of france was a, a, a terrible defeat and and churchill uh, in his speech in parliament um on the 4th of june didn't try and hide that fact um he said wars are not won by evacuations he called it a defeat um but uh, at the same time you know the nobody in Britain was expecting to have to evacuate the army almost immediately. So it was very much an improvisation. Uh, and it was, you know, there's this idea, the British like to think of themselves as best when they're, you know, when they're unprepared, when they're amateurs, when they're, you know, the backs to the wall, when they're improvising. Um, and so in a sense, it sort of played into the British idea of who they are and when they're at their best. You know, there's this idea that British only ever start wars very slowly. They start badly and then they turn things around. Um, but the fact was, it was an improvisation. It had to be improvised very, very quickly, the evacuation. Um, and on that basis, it was a magnificent success in that, it, you know, it was pulled off. Um, but it was also pulled off with a lot of, uh, there was a, you know, there was a lot of fortune in, in, in involved. If you look at various different um, elements from, you know, from, from the weather, uh, the fact that, you know, the sea for most of the, the, the evacuation was calm, um, which allowed the little boats to come in, which allowed the, the ships to go. Um, if you look at the fact that the, there was cloud cover, even though the weather was good, so the Luftwaffe, for a lot of it, couldn't bomb. There was also the smoke coming in, which covered, again, stopped the Luftwaffe. You had the halt order, uh, Hitler's halt order, you know, stopping, well, first of all, Rundstedt, stopping the tanks on the 23rd, and then Hitler um, confirming it on the, uh, on the 24th. Um, so you had a lot of elements that came together, a fortune, if you like, that came together, but then it still had to be carried out. And it was, well, you know, another element, which is somewhere between fortune and genius, was the bringing of the mole into action. You know, the, the, the Luftwaffe had bombed the harbour basically into, into oblivion. The harbour, you know, all of these soldiers had, 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 had retreated back into Dunkirk, which was the only uh, port available. And then the Luftwaffe put the port out of action. So when uh, William Tennant, who was the um, naval man in charge at Dunkirk, uh, arrived on the 27th, he had this dilemma, you know, what, what to do? The port actually isn't working. So immediately, you know, he, he brought all the soldiers out of their, uh, you know, they're all bunk hunkered down in cellars in the town, 
he, he had his men lead them down to the beaches, but initially there were no small ships to come in to bring the soldiers off the beaches to the larger naval uh, uh, ships and ferries offshore. So the first thing he did was to get on the wireless at the French headquarters to say, bring out more ships, more small boats. We need the small boats to take people off to the, the, the bigger ships. But also, we can't use the port, so what do I do? So what he did was to bring the mole, which was only ever a breakwater. You know, it was like a, it was a mile long, but it was to stop the harbour silting up. And it did have a walkway on top, but that walkway had these, you know, huge um, banisters all the way along to stop people falling off. Uh, and it was prone to huge sort of tidal, I think it's 15 foot um, tides, uh, uh, tidal drop. Uh, it just simply wasn't meant, ships had never come alongside it. They weren't meant to. They'd only been recently built actually. Um, and and he managed more on that ship. Uh, and that's what he then brought into action and the vast majority of soldiers came off them. So that's kind of a combination between good fortune and, you know, uh, uh, and brilliant work by, uh, by the Navy. And then you have the fact, you know, the Germans were doing everything to stop the British getting away. This idea that Hitler was building a golden bridge allowing the British to get away. Not much you can say with any certainty in this life, but one thing you can say is Hitler was not allowing uh, the, the, the British army to get away. Um, and, uh, and you had this amazing thing that again, no, not many people have heard about, this idea of degaussing, because the Germans were dropping lots of these mines, these magnetic mines, which the ships um, would, uh, would trigger and explode. And just shortly beforehand, this um, uh, scientist called God Goodeve had discovered basically two ways of putting these mines out of action. One, by sweeping the routes. So, so two ships basically um, uh, trailing uh, behind them things that would set off the mines. And another, by passing coils over the ships, which actually demagnetized them and meant that the mines wouldn't set them off. And so only two ships were, were sunk by magnetic mines when it could have been dozens and dozens of ships. Again, good fortune or genius, you know, somewhere in the middle. So uh, that's a very, very long answer for, uh, yes, I think he was right in saying that. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's an excellent answer because I love that you brought up improvisation, which is something I was certainly going to mm. Uh, try to talk about and you've already touched on now that um it was that kind of confluence of uh you know bad things that happened then some lucky things and then that that ingenuity that you just brought up yeah. so those are some really great points um i guess to back up just a little bit um you know how did they find themselves kind of in this situation you you, you did a really good intro in your book uh, that set up context mm -hmm. that maybe the walter lord book was lacking no, it just seemed to me I, I was, I'm writing for a different, I was in this book writing for a different audience to Walter Lord. So Walter Lord was writing a while ago for people who understood the context. You know, they'd grown up with the context. They, most of them were alive at the, at the time. Um, and if they weren't, you know, then, then they were, uh, you know, their, their family members. It, it was something that people grew up just knowing about. And I think if you're writing, well, first of all, this was, a, 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 a strictly speaking, a film tie-in. So I, I was going to be writing for a lot of people, kids really, um, who had no, hadn't heard, you didn't know anything about the Second World War, let alone Dunkirk. Um, so, so I had to put that in, put, I wanted to put it into greater context. But also, even if you're writing for a relatively knowledgeable audience, I don't think you can take things for granted now the way you could when you were writing earlier, you know, in the 20th century about First World War, Second World War things. Because I, I think now things that, we, that people took for granted, it was kind of in their DNA that they knew these things. They, they knew why people, you know, they just knew why people from that generation behaved why they behaved. Nowadays, we don't. You know, we need a kind of introduction to that generation to explain, you know, even the simpler things, why people did what they did, why they thought the way they thought. Uh, and so I think, you know, without hammering it home, you don't want to be, uh, you know, patronizing about it. But at the same time, you do want to create uh, a, 
a background. You want to, you know, be as atmospheric as you can and try and explain the thinking of why people behaved and said and did the things they did. So you just have to go, you know, just a little further than maybe Walter Lord had to give a bit of background who these young men fighting each other would have been. So that's where the first, you know, chapters uh, came in. Um, and I think that is actually, you know, quite important. And also then I wanted to go into really a lot of detail. You know, you could, Dunkirk is not just the evacuation. You know, that's kind of a sharp end of it. That's a sexy end of it, if you like. <laughs> um, but actually it's the story of the Battle of France. Why did the British army need evacuating? Why were they there? You know, so the whole story, which I think is just fascinating, of these young men joining the army, you know, they, they've been brought up, Brit I'm talking about British perspective at this point, I also talk about the Germans in the book, but, you know, they, 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 they joined the army, um, they've been brought up during a depression, so, you know, maybe it wasn't quite as ferocious in Britain as it was in, in the States, or, or for that matter, in Germany, and so they most of these people have been brought up well first of all they've certainly never been abroad before you know this was a whole new experience for them but they you know they also many of them been brought up without regular meals um uh, and you know you know the army actually had certain attractions that you know maybe we don't think of today to have regular meals and a roof over your head was was not nothing back then you know uh and then again, you know, you joined the army uh, and you did get this sense of adventure. You know, you were going to do something. Um, well, I mean, you have these sort of dual reasons for some people. They joined because it was security uh, in, in, in an insecure world. For others, it was a sense of adventure uh, in a world that didn't offer enough adventure. So you have a lot of these young men going across to France in 1939 and into 1940 never been abroad before no idea what is, what is abroad you know people eat differently people talk differently people so you know i found these wonderful stories of just at the very beginning of the soldiers arriving in france so excited about what is this what is this foreign place going to be like some of them ending up really disappointed that it it's actually not that different from england <laughs> you know you you had people you know, well, one officer said that when the train started rolling through the French countryside, all the men got up staring at the wind through the windows. What is it going to look like? And a bit disappointed that the houses, you know, were square and they had roofs and, you know, it's kind of the same. And, uh, and so there's a lot of that sort of, you know, the novelty of it. Bear in mind also, these soldiers are going out, you know, barely a generation after their fathers and uncles had gone out to the same places in the First World War. So they were going around, you know, while they were very, basically, because nothing happened initially, they just dug themselves in, in France, and then were tourists, really. You know, they, 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 they were mixing with the French people. You know, I talk in the book about one man who married a French woman while he was out there. Um, and they, they were seen as, as kind of, as a rule, not always, but as a kind of saviors, you know, coming to France to, 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 to help um, the French resist the, the Germans. So, so they were very welcome. They tried new foods, uh, some, some didn't. Didn't, not, didn't think much of wine, Did they drank beer. Wine, I don't know, what is this wine? It's not for us. But they were also going out to, um, you know, to these places that their fathers and uncles had fought over and sometimes talked about, sometimes not talked about when they came home. And, 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 you know, the trench lines from the First World War were still there. And they, like, like us today, when, you know, we, you know, it's a very English thing to go out to the, the, to, to the First World War battlefields. They did the same thing. They, and they went to the cemeteries and they saw family members in the cemeteries. And that, for them, had the, the kind of added poignance, poignancy that, you know, when we go, it's very somber. It's you know it's 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 interesting and it's also somber but for them you know they they might face the same fate so it had this you know added element to it um and so so you know just just i, I just thought it was worth talking about the, the beginning even before the fighting started and then when the germans invaded you know they came into 
uh, Belgium on the uh, on the 10th of May, the same day Churchill became prime minister in Britain. Um, and the British went through to meet them uh, from France, where they had been based, into Belgium. They weren't allowed initially in Belgium, into Belgium, because Belgium wanted to stay neutral. They didn't want to provoke the Germans. Um, they, Belgium really was in an impossible position. I mean, they knew they were going to be attacked, but on the other hand, maybe if they didn't provoke the Germans, then they might not. Anyway, so the Germans came into Belgium, the British moved forward uh, to meet them in Belgium. But of course, what nobody on the Allied side expected was that this attack was going to come. That, that was only really a, a, a feint by the Germans. The major attack was going to come further south in the supposedly impassable Ardennes area. Uh, and the French had built the Maginot Line um, uh, between the wars. The idea was the Germans will not pass. Ils ne passeront pas. They can never get through. This was a series of forts on the French border with Germany because the French had learned their lesson. But the lesson they hadn't learned was that the Ardennes actually wasn't impenetrable. First of all, um, troops and then tanks through, they shot through. There was no effective uh, reserves, and you know, within days, really, um, the, the Germans had reached the coast and virtually encircled the British army, British expeditionary force, and the French and Belgian armies to the north. Um, and the battle was over before it had begun. So uh, it's you know it's it's an astonishing story um and so much of the story is comes before the evacuation never mind had begun but even had been decided on you know before lord gort had even who was the leader the, the commander in chief of the british expedition force had even made the very brave and lonely decision which was not supported back in england by churchill or by the people back who didn't know that quite how awful the situation was he made the decision to retreat back to to Dunkirk. But before he even made that decision, so much had already happened, which had set the, set the ground. Anyway, again, another very long answer. No, that's, that's excellent. That's excellent context for some of the motivations that um, led the youth of, of Britain to joining up. And then you've also done well to set us up for, as you described, the, the entirety of the Battle of Dunkirk, which was not just the beaches, which is something oh, that's all about and something that the movie focused on. So uh, yeah. and you started to describe it there really well. So maybe getting back to some of the um, some of the crises and fortunate events, uh, you know, uh, that occurred at that point. Um, yeah. You also you set up well the fact that the the military was kind of ill prepared and during that phony war period. Uh, it kind of let everyone's guard down a bit, you know, um, visiting brothels and having, you know, uh, drinks and stuff like that. So, uh, you know, that's a great image of what we're looking at with the British, kind of a young force, not experienced uh, in Northern France for the first time, uh, back on these World War I battlefields. And now yeah. here comes this newly mechanized uh, German army just sweeping across and blowing everyone's minds. So. See, the thing is, it's, it, 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 it's tempting to see it as, you know, this ill-prepared, the Allies, the British, the French, the Belgians, ill-prepared, the Germans mechanized, and actually it's not as simple as that. It really isn't. But they, were, they were two pretty well-balanced armies, actually. Um, you know, the British, uh, actually, funny enough, a lot of the British, not a lot, but quite a, a fair number of the British soldiers out there were pioneers who were a lot older. Um, these are people who, some of them had fought in the First World War, uh, and they'd been sent out to do the digging and the, the sort of heavy work. These are, uh, and, and they, um, so some of them were older soldiers who'd already fought. Some of them were completely untrained. They were never meant to fight. They never fired a rifle. And, and you know, they, they, and they suddenly found themselves as the Germans came forward, you know, in, in action. Um, when to say they were unprepared is not even to begin. And then again, <laughs> There were also some very well prepared uh, British soldiers who were expecting a fight, who just found themselves retreating immediately and never fired a shot. So, uh, you know, it was, it was chaos. But it's not as though, I think it would be wrong to suggest that the Germans were this amazing, mechanized, unbelievable, 
you know, um, superb force that were just a better and bigger and better and shinier and newer than the Allies. It's not true. They, you know, they were two very well balanced. And, you know, we, we, we think of the Panzers, there's this sort of, oh, the Panzer divisions, wow, you know, these up to the minute tanks that were better than anything. It's not true, actually. You know, the majority of the Panzer the tanks in the Panzer divisions were, you know, they had a lot of training tanks, they had a lot of captured Czech tanks. They had, you know, relatively speaking, not as many of the latest Panzers. And also the British, you know, the, 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 the Matilda II tanks, the later Matilda tanks, were, were actually, the Germans found them very impressive. They couldn't penetrate their armor. Um, there were, there's one interesting event, uh, there are a million interesting events, but there's one, one thing that actually happened during, so the, so the Germans um, uh, uh, sort of shot through the Ardennes and then the, you know, the Panzers moved through towards the coast. And the British mounted a, a very limited counterattack at Arras uh, on the, the um, 23rd, uh, on the 21st of, of May. Um, and uh, that counterattack was done, you know, not, it was only in, you know, in, uh, tanks, um, these Matilda tanks and light tanks. But the fact was that the, the, the Panzers had become so stretched out, um, you know, they, they were so, so far ahead of their, their infantry, their supplies, there was a real worry that they would be the ones who would be caught out by uh, uh, an Allied attack. And they would be the ones who would, who would then need rescuing and the whole German attack would fall apart. And the counterattack was really, well, it, it, it was both immensely successful and totally unsuccessful. It, 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 it basically blundered into, didn't really know where it was going, but it blundered into Rommel's um, uh, Panzer Division uh, and caused immense damage. I mean, it, it was, for, for a while, it looked as though the Panzers were gonna be completely overrun. And Rommel took personal control of the situation and managed to, to overcome it. Um, this, is, this is one of the places where Rommel you know, really got his, um, uh, was building his reputation that later became so, so huge. Uh, uh, and at that point, the Germans became very, very scared of the Brit or the Allied potential. You know, they felt very, very... Uh, the tanks halted, uh, you know, three, two days later, you know, first of all, Rundstedt, then Hitler halted the Panzer tanks before they came into Dunkirk because it was believed that the Allies, they'd shown already, they had the strength to totally, you know, defeat the German attack. So, and the Germans themselves, you know, believed this. So I think it's, it, it's, it's oversimplistic to, to, to think of, you know, this amazing, you know, brilliant German force that just, you know, is, is totally superior to the Allies. It's not true. Um, uh, it, it was much more even thing, and it was really circumstantial, um, the, 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 the advantage that the Germans had, um, you know, tactical, circumstantial, strategic, but, but less so uh, in terms of just, you know, um, uh, uh, dominance of material or better soldiers or, you know, anything like that. Excellent, yes. That is definitely something that, I came to realize through reading both of these books. Um, in fact, I, I know that at least Walter Ward mentioned, and you may as well, that the French army was considered uh, the best military in the world in the interwar period. And so no one knew exactly what the Germans had. They had the advantage of sweeping through a few, you know, smaller countries that didn't put up as much of a fight. And it's like, as soon as they get to France, you're obviously going to see a little different tactic. So you mentioned the counterattack at Arras. Mm -hmm. It's sort of, to me, reminded me of what Dunkirk is, basically a failure at the end of the day, uh, a defeat, but it revealed a lot of things that were actually advantageous to the Allies. Uh, yeah. Like you mentioned, it, it held up their attack. The Germans realized they weren't invincible. The British realized that the Blitzkrieg had limits. Um, mm -hmm. There was a lot of uh, learning going on at this point. And so you also mentioned the halt order, uh, which was, you know, debated about being, uh, you know, about Goring's, um, you know, uh, desire for glory for the Luftwaffe and uh, Hitler's 
you know, emotional decision making, but it was a practical military decision. They had stretched well, their. I think that's right. It, it was a practical. I mean, if you think of, I mean, it made a lot of sense, you know, initially to, to, to halt them. You know, the tanks had got so far ahead of the infantry and far ahead of their supply lines. They were vulnerable to counterattack. Arras had shown them how vulnerable they were to counterattack. The tanks were still needed for what was thought would be a big battle south of the Somme against the bulk of the French army. Um, a lot of the tanks were now worn out. Um, they were out of action. The area getting towards Dunkirk was marshy, not ideal for tanks. And what use would tanks be inside Dunkirk? So there were good practical reasons for halting them for a while. Um, having said that, there were many German uh, generals who just, you know, Halder, for example, uh, who was the chief of staff of German high command, was just, what, what, what are you doing? You've almost beaten them. Why are you stopping now? And so, I mean, it's not, you know, again, like these, it's not, there's no clear cut. Uh, and, 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 and it's absolutely right to say that, that you know, Goering got involved and Goering knew how to play Hitler uh, and, and, and Goering, you know, wanted the glory and, and said to, Hitler, you know, don't don't leave this to your generals, and and it's true they weren't, you know, solidly Nazis. Uh, they were conservative, you know, they weren't all the people tend to think everybody was a Nazi. That's not quite the case. I mean, you know, um, uh, and 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 a lot of the generals, um, you know, von Toma comes to mind in all the stuff that he said and in, 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 when. when um, listen to in a war camp. A lot of the generals were not. Um, uh, uh, Rommel and Goering said uh, to Hitler, let us do it. Luftwaffe, I've been with you from the beginning. Um, the, the Luftwaffe is solidly Nazi. We can do this. We can, we can um, destroy the British army. We can bring it to its knees. Um, and, and, and it did, you know, again, arguably at the time, made sense. So, uh, you know, that was a the story there. What, what isn't true and has been put forward a lot is that, you know, Hitler was, had, well, it is true to say he had a certain respect for the British on a racial basis, da 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 da, but he was certainly not. And he also did believe that the British would, were going to come to terms with him. He, he absolutely didn't see why the British wouldn't come to terms with him. But he wasn't letting the British get away. That's just, you know, good. Off the hook. You know, we let the British get away. Well, again, it's in you know his interest to say that. So, um, Dunkirk itself, the situation, something like a, a, a third of the ships, part of evacuation, ships and boats, were put in action, sunk or put out of action. I think you may have frozen. No, yeah, I, I got you now. Uh, yep. Okay, right. So, again, going back to your original point about how this is a multifaceted event over a couple of weeks, uh, we've been out in the countryside, we've learned through Aras and uh, the halt that, you know, there are some limits to this, but one thing they did learn, the British, was that they were going to have to evacuate. They would not be able to push out and do the counterattack like they would fully like to. So at this point, another aspect of it uh, that's really crucial is the defense of the corridor, the escape corridor, and then the perimeter around Dunkirk. Can you do well to, uh, to give those folks a lot of attention? Uh, well, because you know, they, you know, they were being asked to sacrifice themselves and they knew it. Well, first of all, the French, you know, were, were looking after um, the, the Western parts uh, of the perimeter. Um, and the British were looking after the, 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 the remainder of it. And then as you put the corridor in, um, and th these people were, 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 were being asked to sacrifice themselves for the greater good. And they were un, under no illusions about that. Uh, and they were chosen and they, they did the job and they did it extremely well. And, you know, I found these 
incredible stories of people who, you know, who, who, who were looking at, because if you think about it, I mean, what, the way that it worked for the British, they started off to Belgium, where they were defending the River Dial, line on the River Dial. There was some fierce fighting on the River Dial. And then they were told, when the, when the attack came in the Ardennes, that the soldiers up in the River Dial were told to retreat. They had absolutely no idea why they were retreating. You know, some of them thought that, you know, maybe our battalion's done something wrong, or there's been a breakthrough nearby. So they retreated and they went back to the River Esco. And then there was fierce fighting on the River Esco. And then they had to retreat again. What, what's going on? And and then they started, you know, pouring down this corridor, which was being defended, and the perimeter of Dunkirk, which was being defended. And in the meantime, you have Lord Gort, who is the commander in chief, making that very brave decision, and them through Dunkirk. Dun what is Dunkirk? You're going to Dunkirk. Well, who Dunkirk? A lot of the British, you know, the British never heard of it. A lot of them thought it sounded Scottish. They thought they were being sent back to Scotland. They had no idea. They didn't have maps. You know, so you, I talked to some who said you know, the, the, um, the leaflets that rained down, um, and which I told Christopher Nolan about and he put into the film at the beginning. So they so said, we didn't have a map. This was useful. The Germans were sending us, oh, good, that's Dunkirk. We've got to go this way. Or they were using them as toilet paper. That was the other thing they used them for. So you, two, useful two ways. Um, and, and, um, and so they started. You know, first of all, retreating as units, and then they became more bedraggled, and some were on their own in terrible conditions, some weren't in such terrible, you know, it was no one story. And on, you know, in the, on the corridor and in the perimeter, it's amazing stories of people, you know, what people do, um, just extraordinary stories. And those, the stories are the things that I wanted to put into the book. I wanted to tell it, you know, the whole thing through um, the experiences of these individuals who a lot of the time had no real idea what was going on. They, they were just, you know, fighting their little corner of the, uh, of the battle. And, and these were unsung heroes, I think, because, you know, everybody remembers the evacuation. Very few people remember those who, who sacrificed themselves to, to, to allow the evacuation to take place. Uh, definitely just great that you draw, draw attention to them. Of course, we love our oral histories here, so that's another reason that your book stands out for us. Uh, yeah, you know, I learned through that that they, a lot of them did not make it to the evacuations. Like you said, they fought to the last and sometimes tried to join up with the French and continue to fight, but many of them were taken prisoner, which is a part of this that a lot of people don't realize. Um, before we get to the beaches, I was going to bring up that among all this, there was a leadership change in England, uh, Chamberlain stepping down and Churchill stepping in. Uh, you want to talk about Churchill some and his role in all this? What, what I was going to say, I'll just do, I'll, I'll do that quickly while the internet's <laughs> While we got to, yeah. The, uh, basically, he says, Churchill had this extraordinary power. He said, Churchill made you feel as though you were a great actor in great events. Leadership is dulling the rational faculty and substituting enthusiasm for it. In 1940, on a careful evaluation of the odds, nobody would have moved. And that's the point here. This is what Churchill, this is why he was the man for the time. My goodness me, Churchill made mistakes. He contradicted himself. He, you know, he flip-flopped. He did all sorts of things in other periods of his life, his, his leadership. At this point, my goodness me, he was the man for the job because things were so grim and what the country needed was somebody to do precisely that, dull the, the rational faculty and substitute enthusiasm and he got everybody moving and believing and acting. Um, and I think, you know, while, while I've got you there, um, I'll, mm. I'll make the bigger point, which I think this ties into, which is, you know, if the British Expeditionary Force hadn't got away, if it had been destroyed, um, if the army had been killed, um, captured, then Britain would have had to uh, basically seek terms with Hitler. And, and Churchill told his cabinet um, that Britain would become a slave state if they made peace with Germany. Because can you imagine, I mean, the world we'd be living in today where you know, Europe would be Nazified, without, um, I mean, these are such big topics at the moment anyway, but without Britain to preserve freedom, uh, the rule of law, um, 
then you'd have had these norms, these totalitarian norms just bleeding across Europe. Barbarism, coercion, um, you know, intolerance. These would be the order of the day. Our, our, our default settings, if you like. Um, and, and, you know, I'm speaking now, big admission, I'm speaking as a Jewish person. I mean, my goodness me, Jews would have long since have disappeared from Britain if, you know, if, if, if the Germans had got a foothold. Would America have entered the war? And if they had entered the war, where would the second front have come from? So, you know, it, it's tempting uh, to, to think of Dunkirk, particularly in America. That's why I wanted Americans to see this film, to read this book. You know, it's tempting to think of Dunkirk as, a, you know, um, the, 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 the bit before the Americans, the Russians got involved. It wasn't. It was absolutely crucial. It was more than just this sort of nostalgic echo of former British glory. It was absolutely internationally important that the British army got away, that the war continued. Uh, and, and all that we know that came later was able to happen because of this period. So it's a big story. It's not just a little little English parochial story. Uh, and that's why I was so happy to come on board the film to write this book, to try and get these points across. Um, yeah, so, and I just can't believe the internet's held up for long enough for me to say yeah. that. So. <laughs> well, that was an excellent, you know, overall arching point that uh, certainly reading your book, I started to think about, you know, like how, how huge this was for the world, not just a little British story, as you said. Um, the, you know, I, I guess, you know, there was two things I was going to get to, but I'll, I'll jump ahead to this. It's, it's kind of like the legacy and the meaning of it today. Uh, yeah. You know, when the re soldiers returned, they felt like they had betrayed their country, yeah. they were treated, and, and all the civilians were lauding them and saying, no, you, you've, you've, you've lived to fight another day. And, and it truly did create this new communal uh, volunteerism uh, you know, movement there that even stretched on for years where the government actually did more civil service programs and social programs. And so all of that made me think about today with Brexit, yes. with COVID-19, uh, with the civil rights movements, uh, the Black Lives Matter movements, all these things kind of wrapped up together, started coming to my mind at the end of this thinking, wow, here was a period where everyone was together about this, not just Britain, but as you said, in an international coalition. We yeah, are now facing, maybe for the first time since World War II, a truly global, you know, crisis. Yes. Um, so talk about, or, you know, do you, do you see any parallels with... Oh, I mean, absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, it's, it's, it, it's a brilliant point. I think, <sighs> where to begin with this? So um, <laughs> the... Uh, the Dunkirk, as you say, the evacuation gave rise to this idea of which we still have in Britain today, still bandied around this idea of Dunkirk spirit. Yeah, it's used very casually today. You know, uh, it, it's sort of what it means in England is you know, fighting, coming together when your backs are against the wall. Um, uh, so you know, when when a few years ago there were floods all over the uh, Britain and people were helping each other out this is dunkirk spirit you know that's it, it, events like that that's when it's pulled out um uh, and, and some people are cynical about it saying you know well it was it was very much a con government construct after mm -hmm. dunkirk but actually i don't think it was i mean i've really looked into this and as you say it was that the army came back and the army my god the army was in a terrible state and they were angry a lot of them they felt they'd been let down they felt they were and they'd shamed the country um, they felt they'd been sent, some people felt they'd been sent into something they didn't, you know, were, were incapable of achieving. They'd been let down by their leads, all these kind of, you know, d d different views. And there was certainly a lot were ashamed and they came back and they were treated as heroes. Um, and that wasn't on the, you know, the government hadn't created that. That was totally instinctive. That was, you know, organic. And it, I think partly it was because people were just relieved that, relieved on two grounds. One, that their brothers and sons and, you know, were, were coming home. I mean, thank God, he's, he's actually home. But, but two, we're still in this. We can still fight. Um, it's a massive outpouring, in, you know, organic outpouring of relief, which was what Dunkirk Spirit was, which then, you know, Churchill's speech on the 4th and um, 
and all these things built up and played into. But my goodness, it was real and it was organic and it was, you know, people felt it. Um, and, and then, you know, you found that in the weeks afterwards, you had, if you look at the, um, the news, you know, the Times newspaper and you look at the, the editorials, if you look at the way people was in public life were speaking, they were talking about we're all in this together in a way they hadn't done before. Um, you know, this idea, people were already starting to think, even though the war was virtually lost, people were starting to think about what they wanted from the post-war world. There was a sort of reconstruction committee um, in, in the government formed of what, what we want. And, you know, lots of pe people who you never imagine it were talking about, it must be a fairer world. It must be a world where everybody has a stake in their future. This is where, you know, the, the, the post-war government came from. You know, this is, this is where it started to be built, um, you know, at this time. And again, you had also, we're with the Americans. You know, the Americans came in slightly later. The Russians came in in June um, uh, of 41. Uh, uh, and, you know, we're, we're, we're starting to look, think globally now. You know, we're, we're, our allies, the people that we rely on, are just people who necessarily think the same way that we do. So, you know, all of this was absolutely building up. And in Britain, you know, it got its culmination at the, at the end of the war. Um, but I think it, there's so much, you know, now we're sort of tearing down the idea of globalization. We, you know, we're, we're sort of returning to, 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 to the, the idea of nationalism, which was something that actually, you'd think that a war would increase our sense of nationalism. In some ways, it actually, you know, work, this particular war worked the, in some ways worked the other way. But we're starting, I think, you know, the fact is there are very few people around now who remember that time. Um, and so, you know, so a lot of the ideas that came out, you know, seem relevant anymore, don't seem important anymore. We just cherry pick what we want, what, you know, backs up our own worldview nowadays from that event. So I think if you look at it more closely, you'll find, as you say, a world where, certainly in Britain, where suddenly volunteerism became a word. We, what can I do to help? How can we work together? Um, and so many of the post-war ideas that, you know, in Britain, uh, you know, we, it's funny, you know, the National Health Service is such a funny one, you know, in, in Britain, it's a religion. I mean, I don't know if you remember the um, uh, opening ceremony of the, the London Olympics, whenever it was, 2012. And the opening ceremony had this great big sort of, you know, Mary Poppins dance number with hospital beds and all these, and, and it had an actor playing Churchill, appearing out of the top of Timothy Spall, out of the top of Big Ben and talking about, it was an absolute get back to this time when people pulled together and that created, um, you know, the, the, the Britain that we, that's about the last time Britain was unified at all, 2012 Olympics. But that was what it was, it was looking back to. Uh, and, and you had this idea in Britain of the National Health Service as being a unified fact, you know, something that everybody loves. To a lot of Americans, it makes no sense at all. You know, it's a, it's a socialist measure. Why would you love something that, um, and it's a sort of, you know, the, the divide between the two countries. But in Britain, we, we do love the National Health Service and it came out exactly out of this period of, we must look after, you know, we all have a stake in, 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 in each other's futures. Um, so it's, it's, it's a strange time and it's a time that, you know, I, I, I do think of a lot now that we are so polarized, you know, basically in Britain as well as in the States, you know, everybody just, you take your side and that's it. You can't agree on anything. You, you know, you wish nothing but the worst on your enemies who, who think differently to you. And this was not that time. This was a very different time to that. So yeah, again, another very long answer. And a great answer because, you know, that's, some of my favorite parts of doing these uh, you know, these book club selections is to look for larger themes like that. Mm -hmm. um, because why would we read about these events that have passed if they weren't still influen influencing things today? Mm -hmm. And your example of the National Health Services is just perfect because it's something that grew out of that, that time and that spirit. And, uh, and it's something that is actually uh, visible today on the front lines of our current crisis. So, and that volunteerism 
Yeah. You know, you can really, really see how it evolved out of Dunkirk, you know, yeah. out of the evacuation. In the weeks following the evacuation, you can kind of see its birth. You know, 19, 1940, people, you know, say, oh, but surely all that was post-war. The roots were right here, you know? Yes. Um, I, I had several little examples pulled out uh, that you mentioned, um, you know, that during uh, Dunkirk that volunteerism really came about. Women's Institute collected uh, food, women's voluntary service created uh, canteens, uh, a Citizens Advice Bureau gave yes. welfare guidance. Um, and then I love these, the, the local defense volunteers or home guard, including the first American motorized squadron, a group of well-to-do Americans in Britain who were all on board with this before, you know, America and FDR decided to jump into the war. And they were like, hey, send over guns, money, whatever you can. And uh, I thought that was a pretty cool example. Well, you, you know, you've also got another thing I've been looking at um, recently, you know, the, 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 Ameri the Eagle Squadron, um, yes. you know, the, the Americans, you know, these volunteers who, who you know, came, came to Britain uh, I mean, some of them originally went out to France and then were forced to come to Britain. But, you know, who fought in the Battle of Britain or shortly after the Battle of Britain and were absolutely inspired to, you know, well, inspired by a lot of things. I mean, it's too simplistic to say they were, you know, inspired by freedom and, you know, some of them wanted adventure. And, and but, <laughs> but the fact is, you know, here they were, Americans who were coming over before America was in the war and when, in fact, you know, I think it was illegal for them to, to actually come. And, 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 um, whatever illegal means and 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 but here they were you know fighting um because you know don't forget after dunkirk you know you had the battle of britain and then the blitz coming in you know close. these were all really part of a, a single parcel um uh you know a sort of turn of event a, a single sort of, um sweep of events uh and a fascinating one as far as I'm... yeah I don't know if you can hear me, but I certainly I can't. can't hear you. You're back. I got oh, you. You're back. You're back. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so right. I, I think I know where you left off there. And, and I think that's something that maybe we can definitely take away from this at the end of the day is, uh, you know, a little bit of that Dunkirk spirit, you know, something mm -hmm. that we should all take going forward with this current situation. If, if we can just remember back to this time that you so well describe in your book, perhaps we could work together a little bit more. Um, well, I guess we're just about out of time. Uh, I, you know, I had a whole list of things, but an hour is never enough, right? So what's rather brilliant is we managed to talk all the time without actually talking about the evacuation. Which is I know, I know. and I, dude, I had a whole list of things about the beach itself, you know, so. uh, because you know everyone talks about the beach. And I was like, well, let's get to everything first, and then we'll get to the beach. But something that you left us with, and the big takeaway of the book was was the varied experiences on the beach, um, that it's not a monolithic experience, that it's something that each in individual, you know, went through, you know, there was panic and starvation and, and injuries and deaths. And then on the same time, on the same beach, there was people reading books and drawing and yeah. taking drink rides and getting drunk. So that's, yeah. a, that's a story. That's a bigger picture. You know, there's never any one story. It's what I think I loved about the film, actually, is that, you know, it, it, again, you, it's so easy to be simplistic about these things. Here's the story of X. Well, no, it's not. And the fact is that, you know, Dunkirk is a great example because it's going to enclose, the evacuation is an enclosed event. You know, 10 miles of beaches, you know, hundreds of thousands of people over 10 days, every kind of behavior was there. Anything you want to look for, it was there. So don't ever say, you know, it was like this or it was like this. It was like this. It was all... All of, all of human life was there. Yes, I loved your description in the book. You said it as uh, the whole world was on that beach. You, you had hundreds of thousands of people, which is like a city or multiple cities. Okay. And when you go into a city, you get every kind of human being. So, you know, again, to kind of dovetail with our discussion, um, it's something to remember that we all experience things differently, um, but we try to survive in the end, which is what kind of yeah. film, I think, uh, you know, came out of this was a survival yeah. film. So, it's a survival film, exactly. Exactly. So, well, man, uh, <laughs> I can't think of a better way to wrap it up, actually. Uh, like you said, it's funny that we didn't even talk about the beach itself as much. But again, a lot of people know a lot about that. So that's I'm glad quite nice, actually. It's quite nice yeah. to do it, you know, to talk about this without 
doing let's say doing the obvious we could do another hour on the beach if you like but that i mean i would i would love to do that that would be great man um and like i said i really hope in the future we can get you down here to new orleans for an in-person uh, i'd love it i'd love it we will keep the lines open for that and um again thank you for taking the time out of your day to uh do this with us and um you know appreciate your work and uh stay safe and everything and to you, very nice to very nice to meet you. If if we have met, I don't know if this counts as meeting, but if it does, then lovely to meet you, Wesley. I'll take it. You as well. Thanks, Josh. Bye bye.